टुडे इज आवर लेक्चर नंबर 15 वी विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट एटमॉस्फेरिक कंपोजिशन एंड सरफेस प्रॉपर्टीज यूजिंग रिमोट सेंसिंग सो वी डिस्कस्ड द रिटेड प्लेट ऑफ रिमोट सेंसिंग अर्लियर इन द लेक्चर ऑफ रेडिएटिव ट्रांसफर सो वी लर्न दैट रिमोट सेंसिंग इज सेंसिंग और स्टडिंग अ सरफेस और एटमॉस्फेयर और एनी ऑब्जेक्ट फ्रॉम अ डिस्टेंस अ रिमोट सो रिमोट वर्ड मीन्स यू स्टडी something from a distance so sensing means you are sensing it using some techniques or instruments you have is it too loud yeah i think it will be better now okay so here is a chart uh, depicting the comparison between uh, or among the atmospheres of different planets in our solar system so as you can see Uh, pluto is not there because pluto is not considered as a planet anymore it is considered as a dwarf planet if you remember the definition right in first lecture i think i have mentioned that so the thing is here are few things which i wanted to mention you can see there is a di difference the giant planets the gas giants and the terrestrial planets on the left so terrestrial planets if you see venus and mars their composition is primarily made of carbon dioxide so about 95 96% is carbon dioxide in their atmosphere earth is very different so we learned that how earth evolved very differently because of the life okay so all the carbon dioxide was converted into oxygen eventually and, mo and most of the carbon dioxide got trapped in the oceans in on earth but that kind of activity did not happen on venus or mars one thing to note here is that mercury atmosphere might be misleading you might think that mercury is like 42% or something oxygen yes and then nitrogen so it is very rich in oxygen but that is not the case the thing is mercury has almost no atmosphere its atmosphere is almost trillion times thinner than earth's atmosphere so practically it is non existence there are only few molecules present uh, in the atmosphere of mercury few gas molecules so technically it's not an atmosphere but uh, for like this comparative terms i am just putting it here so those few molecules you can have oxygen molecule also you can have nitrogen molecule also but as i said technically it is not an atmosphere at all and why there is no atmosphere there are a few hypotheses we will get into details in the mercury lecture but i have uh, briefly mentioned it earlier due to the solar wind activity it strips off lot of atmosphere and also there is a hypothesis that a giant body impacted mercury when that bombardment phase was happening and that stripped off a significant amount of mercury's atmosphere at early stages so because of that mercury has a very thin or non existent atmosphere so uh, other than that you can see the gas giant are mis mostly made up of hydrogen and helium so about 90% more than 90% are hydrogen and helium okay and so coming to the introduction part so we learned about spectroscopy in the last class so this is kind of an application of that spectroscopy in a broader sense so now we are going to use the principles of spectroscopy to identify these gases in the planetary atmosphere so we learned in the previous lecture that each molecule or compound produces its own spectrum so if you look at any particular atmosphere and you see its absorption or reflectance lines on any spectrograph you can tell what kind of composition it uh, ex there exist okay and then first you will get the what kind of gases are there and then you determine the composition later on like how much particular gas is present so before i get into more details first we have to get uh, some fundamentals Uh, and first we have to understand some fundamentals about planetary atmosphere and then we get ahead with more details so first and foremost is our ideal gas law so this is known by almost all of you uh, you might have heard it somewhere that ideal gas law so most of the planetary atmosphere follow this ideal gas law so what does it mean it means they simply follow this equation p equals to pv equals to nrt so to simplify it i have written it in the form of pressure equals to rho rt rho is your density so n is your number of 
um, uh, moles so n divided by v and then you just make some adjustments you get density actually uh, and that is why this r here is universal gas constant this r star, but this r is not universal this is a specific gas constant. So, this is defined by r star divided by m where m is the molar mass of the gas. So, that is how you come up for this equation. This equation is simpler why because you just need to know the density. So, pressure equals to density times r is which is a constant for a particular type of gas and then T is the temperature again absolute temperature in Kelvins. So, this is an easier version of this ideal gas equation because in planetary atmosphere it is very difficult to measure n like number of molecules or the volume itself because the planetary atmospheres are huge. So, the thing is if you can measure the density and the temperature you can utilize this equation to determine the pressure or vice versa depending on which uh, parameter you want to understand or measure you can measure other two and then figure out the third one very easily. So, density is more practical in terms of planetary atmospheres. So, we will be using this equation, but remember the difference in this equation P equals to rho R T R is not universal gas constant. It is determined by uh, dividing this universal gas constant by the molar mass of the gas which so R is a specific gas constant not universal gas constant. So, this R will vary for different uh, gases and different uh, atmosphere also. Okay. So, now coming to the basic uh, barometric equation. So, barometric equation is so how do we understand it first barometer means uh, when you try to relate something with pressure. So, this is like pressure equation. So, this is uh, very simple we know pressure is equals to force divided by area okay, we all know that. So, the same principle applies everywhere as you know that physics does not change it is just we are changing the application of this physics for the planetary atmosphere. Okay. So, the basic equation pressure equals to force divided by area. Now, in this case we are considering a small uh, cube or a small object on the right hand side top you can see that uh, image. So, we are considering a small cube and on top of it the pressure is uh, p top and bottom is p bottom okay. and the area surface area is a. Okay. So, what we are doing here we are trying to balance the forces in this thin uh, cube which is z and delta z. So, thickness is delta z in this case. Okay. So, when you try to balance the forces how you balance the force. So, there are two forces one is this pressure force okay, and second is gravity. These are the two forces which are balancing the atmosphere there is no third force. Can you think of anything else? No, because there is nothing it is just pressure and the gravity they are trying to balance each other. So, that it can maintain a stable atmosphere. Okay. So, this is true for again any kind of planetary atmosphere. Now, what uh, here it, it is done is on the left hand side it is rho again density times gravity. So, you know force equals to mass times acceleration. So, in this case acceleration is gravitational acceleration. So, that is why g is there mass how do you calculate mass you multiply density with volume all right. So, here rho is your density and a d z is your volume a is the surface area d z is the thickness. So, you multiply surface area with thickness you get the volume you multiply volume with the density you get the mass you get multiply mass with the acceleration then you get the force clear. Okay. Yeah, do not try to memorize everything if your logic is correct you will get there. On the right hand side the same thing is there force equals to pressure times area. So, the first in the block uh, is difference in pressure. So, P z minus P z plus d z. So, P z is the pressure here and P z plus d z will be pressure at the top. Okay. So, difference in pressure multiplied by the area you get the force. Okay. So, once you balance these two and rearrange them you get a equation like this this is simple <coughs> this is simple rearrangement. So, you cancel out area and then you just rearrange the equation you get this. So, in the simpler form we can write it like this d p by d z equals to minus rho g. So, here you can see mass is not there area is gone. So, the 
change in pressure with altitude is directly proportional to the density of that layer okay g is constant gravitational acceleration is constant so that's why this kind of the balance is known as hydrostatic balance again this is true for almost all the planetary atmosphere as long as it is a stable atmosphere okay so this is known as a very popular hydrostatic balance where pressure gradient is supported by the gravity okay simple enough any questions queries so now we will use that ideal gas law which we learned just uh, now and this ideal gas law we will utilize with this hydrostatic balance to find a kind of a relationship between pressure and the altitude so first we write the ideal gas law that first equation now what we do okay i'll write it so what we are doing here is since your p is equals to rho r t so what we are doing we are just rearranging we are saying rho equals to p by r t okay and once we replace this rho in your hydrostatic balance equation we will get the equation the uh, second equation written up there that is dp by dz equals to that one so we know that dp by dz is equals to minus rho g all right so you replace this rho here you will get that equation p by rt times g that is what this equation on the slide is second equation okay all right so now again after once we get that second equation we again rearrange it so we get we take all the pressure uh, values on the left hand side so dp by p and then equals to some constants multiplied <coughs> by <coughs> excuse me multiplied by dz okay now we just simply integrate it so the integration is not very complex dp by p once you integrate it with respect to p you get log z sorry log p okay so log p equals to the same thing minus g z by rt and then you take exponential on both sides so this is what you are getting you are getting logarithmic of p equals to minus g z by rt this is what you will get once you will in, uh, integrate that equation okay and then you just simply take an uh, uh, an exponential on both sides oh, sorry you will also get a constant so in this case we are assuming that constant as p not you will get a constant also because you are integrating so an integration constant will be there sorry a plus will be there okay so uh, you know that right once we integrate we have to put a integration constant also so that constant is p not we are assuming like a p not okay and once you do take an exponential on both side you will get an equation like this pz equals to p not which is the integration constant and exponential of minus z by h that h is the scale height i think you, if you remember briefly i mentioned this scale height in one of the previous lectures where i was i was discussing about the planets and planetary like change of pressure with altitude so i briefly mentioned it so this is the scale height i was talking about again this is scale height varies from different planet to planet why it varies because it depends on many factors which is r t by g so r as you know is a specific gas constant so that will change with the composition of the atmosphere t is the absolute temperature and g is the gravitational acceleration of that particular planet so that is why the scale height will vary for different planets so sometimes you might have to calculate it sometimes it might be given in the problem itself okay so for the case of earth this is scale height if you calculate comes around 8.4 kilometers okay you can think of it as an average height also so in the next lecture when we'll learn about earth atmosphere we'll see that this is kind of a thickness if you bring the entire atmosphere down to a constant density okay because the density decreases as you go up also pressure decreases but if you can theoretically bring all the atmosphere down to a constant density then you will achieve a thickness of about 8 or 9 kilometers for the case of earth so this you can <coughs> 
as I said you can think of it as an average thickness of the particular atmosphere. So, that is why it is called scale height ok. This is kind of a height we are scaling to. So, if you use this and then you just uh, uh, for any height h you can determine the net pressure. So, in this case we are uh, uh, taking p naught as the pressure at height z equals to 0. So, in case of earth this p naught will be around 1013 millibar 1013 1, millibar ok. Yes. Where? Ok, ok. So, to answer you are he is asking like T temperature is also a function of Z, but in this case uh, there is an assumption I forgot to mention uh, that is a good question. Uh, now, I will explain it. So, in this case we are assuming an isothermal atmosphere. So, the temp we are assuming that temperature is not changing with altitude. So, yes there is a one caveat which I forgot to mention. The caveat is yes this equation is decently valid, but this is not valid for large distances. So, for example, if you want to apply this equation and you want to determine the pressure at 100 kilometers this will not uh, this won't, uh, this is not the right equation to do so. So, then what you do you take your p naught at a certain height you get even closer ok. So, that is how you do it you cannot apply this equation for infinity. So, once you go in like upper atmosphere around let us say 70 kilometer 80 kilometers this equations will not be valid anymore because the temperature fluctuations are very high. So, then in that case this is not applicable, but this is decently applicable in, uh, in troposphere ok. Up to 10 15 kilometers you can apply without any problems, but beyond that you cannot assume that the atmosphere is isothermal and then the problem appears. So, this is only a simple uh, derivation or simple explanation or understanding of pressure drop with altitude. So, this gives you a good idea, but only up to a certain extent not uh, like up to the entire atmosphere all right. So, before we get any further one thing is yes yeah 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 like you you figure that at this yeah you can take l n ok. So, yeah just take the logarithmic. So, that will fix the problem for you in exponential it will fix the problem. So, yeah I studied integration long time back. So, I forgot everything now I do not remember mathematics. So, what <laughs> you guys are there to help me ok. Uh, so, the thing is now uh, another concept is solid angle. So, we understand simple angles if two lines meet each, each other at a certain point there is an angle they make any two lines when they meet they form an angle. So, solid angle is just the 3D version of the angle ok. In practical or real life you always have solid angles. For example, if a satellite is up there and trying to measure or map a surface it will measure in a certain 3D angle because of the aperture ok. You, it cannot measure in 2D no instrument can measure in 2D you have to have like an opening and if there is an opening it will have a 3D kind of opening. It can be very very thin, but it still it will be have some 3D uh, effect. So, that 3D angle is your solid angle. So, normal angle they vary from like 0 to 180 and then goes to 360, but this is like 4 pi. So, solid angle because it exists in 3 di dimensions it can go from 0 to 4 pi normal angles they only go from 0 to 2 pi clear. You can think of it as a center of a sphere. So, if I give you like a football and you are sitting at the center you are looking at a point what will happen you make a circle on the surface of a uh, football ok. And that circle when you take that circle and bring it to the center that a cone that cone what you will make that cone angle will be your solid angle. Okay. So, this is like a cone uh, that images might uh, be able to help you uh, this. So, here is a simple equation 
where uh, field of view is given as like sigma equals to a by r square, which is also called solid angle given by omega, okay, capital omega. So, generally solid angle is written as capital omega, it is like a terminology used for solid angles, right. So, remember here this a is the area of the circle it is creating or it is kind of measuring. So, if you have a satellite and you are looking down, it is the <coughs> area of the circle it is mapping okay a satellite so a is the area okay and r is not the radius r is the distance so people get confused a lot this r is not the radius r is the distance so sometimes you might get confused that okay this is the circle it is measuring so that r might be the radius of that circle but no r is not the circle of that radius uh, radius of that circle it is mapping it is the distance between your sensor and the surface okay or the observer and the object r is the distance don't get confused and a is the area okay so once you calculate it and then this is like the differential form in the terms of theta and phi so what is theta and phi theta is uh, latitude uh, or colatitude and phi is the longitude so, in this image it is more clear on the bottom image. So, theta you are measuring in the vertical direction. So, for example, north is up there north pole and you measure an angle from north. So, that is your theta. Okay? You start from 0 go to any angle. So, that is your theta and then your phi is the angle on the horizontal. So, you take uh, any 0 uh, uh, longitude and then from there you measure plus and minus or you go from 0 to 360. So, both are correct. Okay? So, that is what theta and phi are and then this is the differential form you can. Uh, <coughs> so, here is an example the thing is I am not going to calculate it you can calculate it in your free time, but the thing is if you have a want to calculate a solid angle of a satellite with 40 centimeter aperture diameter and altitude 705 kilometer how do you do that? So, in this case as I mentioned the distance is your r. So, r will be 705 kilometers. So, you have to convert it into meters and then area will be pi r square. So, centimeter you have to convert to meters and only then you can put this in this equation and then you will get the final solid angle. Okay? The number will be very very small uh, in order of 10 power minus 7, 10 power minus 8 or something, but you get the idea. And smaller the solid angle better will be your resolution because the uh, instrument can see even finer objects. Okay? If your solid angle is bigger what will happen? You will map a bigger area. So, resolution will go uh, resolution will be poor because now you are measuring big big chunks. So, if your solid angle is smaller you can may map a smaller smaller uh, chunks. Okay, I have spent too much time on that. So, getting bit faster. So, here is an equation again you do not have to memorize any of the equations as I mentioned multiple times. So, do not worry about that, but understand the concept behind it. In exam if you get a question about solid angle do not mix up r and a. I have seen that people doing it. Okay, so, you do not have to mix that up. You will get the equation, but still you will mix up because you put a in the r and r in the a and then you will get completely different answer. So, just uh, f uh, like try to understand that like what is what. Okay? Same with this equation again you do not have to memorize anything this is just for your understanding that <coughs> if you want to def define a radiance in differential form it looks like this and why I am giving you this equation because there is a solid angle component there in the denominator. Okay? Why in the denominator? Because if you have a smaller solid angle you will receive less radiance because the amount of radiation or radiance coming will be from a relatively smaller area. Okay? So, that is why there is a inverse proportionality there understood. So, similarly you have a spectral radiance. So, if you remember we discussed about a spectral radiance also. So, you just need to divide by either frequency or the wavelength you are focusing on. So, d lambda or d nu nu is frequency. So, radiance uh, one important thing is this radiance is independent of distance. Why? Because on the numerator you have this d 2 re right. So, radius term means distance term, but at the denominator you have solid angle. So, further you go away the smaller your solid angle will become. So, they cancels out. 
so the radiance you will get will be the same but irradiance will be different because irradiance depends on the distance okay so don't get confused this is radiance not irradiance <clears throat> and now how do we measure it using some atmospheric windows so we'll see what those are in a bit but before that we just first understand how measurements are made and what kind of satellites we have so we have two type two main or major category of satellites first is pose second is goes so there is a rhyme also goes pose okay so the pose yeah you can write a song about it if you are creative enough goes pose goes pose okay so the pose is uh, as the it says po so po means polar okay uh, so these satellites are polar orbiting satellites what does it mean it means they are orbiting around the poles as you can see in the image also uh, first image that the satellite is orbiting around the poles okay and earth or a planet is rotating under it so that's why they are polar orbiting satellites or polar orbiting environmental satellites and they go about like 400 to 1000 km altitude and they take about 80 to 90 minutes to complete one orbit okay now the goes so as it says goes so it goes away so they are basically geostationary satellite they stay very far away one of the assignment you calculated the altitude also so that is around 36000 km from the surface of the earth so you can imagine how far they are so they are called geostationary satellite because they appear not moving from the surface of the earth so they take exactly 24 hours to complete one rotation and that is why they appear stationary from the surface of the earth all right clear go suppose okay so here is an image again so this is like further away okay so there are few types of observations we do from using the same satellite we can do different type of observation one is nadir means agir okay you drop from the top actually nothing is dropping this is i am just telling you how so you can remember the difference so when you measure from the top or a vertical line of view then it is called nadir because something can fall off directly right so that way you can remember you can find some other technique also this is how i used to memorize now i don't have to use these techniques but maybe you will use so the thing is when you have a surface and you are trying to look down exactly or almost at 0 degree angle then it is called nadir observation okay if you do from a like horizontal direction so your surface is like this and you are trying to look from this direction horizontally then it becomes limb observation so here a is your nadir these both are limb uh, observation now limb you can do two type of observation one is your emission so emission is when you don't have a source present so that then you only get emission no reflectance no absorption only emissions but in case you have an object or source present like sun moon or a star then you can get absorption images or absorption measurement also clear questions no because in this case what you are doing you have a sunlight let's say coming and you are trying to measure how much it gets absorbed when it passes through the atmosphere because you can easily measure sunlight when you just have to go up a little bit with satellite right or you just have to move your sensor up or down a little bit and then you can measure the direct sunlight and once you move it down you can measure the sunlight through the atmosphere so you can determine how much absorption is happening in the atmosphere itself okay okay this limb technique this absorption technique which i am mentioning here is also referred as occultation so occultation is a more scientific term people use uh, i'll get into details later with uh, in this lecture itself so occultation is this technique you try to understand the atmosphere of a planet using the occultation so you have like a sun on the other side or a source you can put your own source also and then you just take the absorption pattern on the other side so that gives you the bending angle using the bending angle you can measure the density basically because refraction is happening right so refraction tells you how much bending is happening so bending tells you the density difference within the atmosphere 
So this is a technique used. Okay, so goes pose again. So what are the benefits or drawbacks of these satellites? Simple, you just have to use your common sense. Goes, they said these satellites are very far away. So once you go far away, what happens? Your spatial resolution will decrease. Simple, you try to see people, let's say uh, there are 100 people sitting. If I want to see them from a kilometer, I might not able to even tell there are 100 people, right? Because my resolution will decrease. The same thing happening with the GOES also. Other benefit is, since uh, the GOES is always looking at the same place uh, all the time, you get a good temporal resolution. Temporal means time resolution. Means you can look at the same place over and over as quickly as you want, as slow as you want. You don't have to move your satellites, you don't have to wait for the satellite to come back again at the same spot. And that is the problem with the post satellite. Because post satellites are moving very fast. Yes, they are moving fast, they are covering a lot of uh, area, but the problem is they only come at the same spot every day, but at the same time only. So for example, if there is a tornado there, or big storm is coming, or you want to study atmospheric pattern in your country, I don't care what is happening in United States, right? Let's say some tragedy is going to happen in India. I want to study it every minute, but the post satellite will be gone. It will come back in the next 24 hours or something to the same spot. So I'm stuck, okay? But with the goals, I can just study the same spot as quickly as I want, depending on my need and my satellite capabilities, all right? So that is the benefit of goals, but also the drawback of pose. But the same uh, time, the spatial resolution from goals, it is so far away, we might not able to uh, discriminate uh, or differentiate between different object or different patterns on the surface as well as we can do with the pose. Because pose is so close, it can give you a much better spatial resolution. Understood? <coughs> and all the stuff is written here. It's just like uh, elaborated details are there. You can read them. If you have any questions or queries, you can ask me. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> uh, one thing with goes is, <coughs> you might be thinking since goes is sitting that far, it might just take like the snap of 50% uh, of Earth. But that is not the case because Earth is a sphere. So the edges fall out. So this image you only cover 42% of Earth with one satellite, one GO satellite. So you have to put at least three satellites, GO satellites in a space if you want to observe the entire Earth completely. So at least three satellites you have to put, not two. Two won't work, okay? You understood why it won't work? Okay, good. So now the thing is, we only use, we also use these atmospheric windows. I'll get into a little bit more detail, but we studied that lot of different components in our atmosphere, they absorb different wavelengths. And because of that, we cannot study uh, like the space or we cannot study the surface if you are not using those particular wavelengths which provide windows, which are not so much absorbed by the components in our atmosphere. Right? Otherwise, everything gets absorbed, especially water vapor is a beast. Water vapor just takes uh, everything. It absorbs microwave, it absorbs UV, it absorbs visible, what not. So that is the problem. So we have certain windows. So one good window in visible is this 0.55 to 0.7 microns. So visible is mostly a, a, like uh, act as a window. So visible, if not, just imagine. Uh, if visible range won't be a window, what will happen? Everything will appear dark. If visible light cannot come through, what will happen? The sky will block everything, the atmosphere will block everything, right? And it will appear dark. So visible, we have a good window. Mid-IR, we have a 6.5 to 6.7 micron window that also helps us studying water vapor, uh, okay? And then thermal, we have 10 to 12 micron window. So before I get into more details of windows and all, there are two ways of measuring. One is active remote sensing, one is passive remote sensing. So as the name suggests, active means you are actively measuring. What does actively measuring means? You have your own source. So you put your own source in the satellite itself, okay? So for example, you put a laser there or some kind of source, whatever wavelength you are interested in measuring. So you put your own source. So now you are not dependent on any natural sources. So 
that is the benefit of that then you have passive way of doing it passive means you are not depending not your own source but you are dependent on natural sources for example sun you wait for the sun to come up uh, reflect from the surface or limb observation through the atmosphere and then you measure so gps is an active technique gps your like uh, mobile phones have gps right so those satellites have active sensors they have their own sources they send signal then other satellite receives signal so multiple signals are sent at the same time received at the same time and then triangulation is done okay i'm not getting into gps again then i will digress to a different field but the thing is that's how active source work passive is you put a sensor up there and you wait for solar sun source or some other active source or any uh, or just emission coming from the earth surface as simple as that the benefit is in active source as i said you don't have to wait for the natural sources but passive another benefit is they are cheap because now you are not putting your own source there so they are cheap to make second thing is passive sources or passive technique use less energy because you don't have your own source so you don't have to burn more fuel so your mission can go for longer period of time okay so that is th those are couple of benefits of passive technique also and i have mentioned some uh, examples here are like sar synthetic aperture radar is an active sensor laser altimeter active sounders and then uh, spectrometer radiometer and then passive sounders are there which are passive sensors okay one question why synthetic aperture radar is called synthetic aperture radar what is synthetic there quickly quickly because it's not actually present there not from csre csre people they already know excuse me yeah the radar length okay uh, he is almost correct i'll explain it a better way so synthetic aperture radar means you have a radar antenna and it has a certain diameter okay and that diameter is very small because you are putting it in a satellite you cannot put a big antenna but if you want to get a good resolution and good uh, information you want to collect you need bigger antenna bigger the antenna you collect more information more information means more better resolution better results okay so the technique to do that with a smaller antenna is you use the same antenna you take multiple measurements through a profile okay so you go through like this you take a swath okay and then you just integrate all of them in one image or one Uh, spectrum or whatever so that one image will be an integrated effect or combined effect of this entire swath you are taking so you are synthetically increasing the size of the antenna so that's why synthetic aperture radar you are synthetically making this aperture bigger so that you can get a better resolution or more better information okay okay now coming to wavelength ranges so there are four major wavelength areas or broad wavelength ranges one is uv then visible infrared and microwave okay these are the four regions where we try to study the atmosphere and surface as a whole okay and each of them have their own benefits and drawbacks again as you learn that <coughs> not all can pass through that our atmosphere but sometimes we want that we don't want a particular wavelength to pass through the atmosphere why because we want to study the atmosphere if everything passes through what we will study we will only get to study the surface so if you want to study the atmosphere you want some absorption or scattering happening in the atmosphere itself so just for example you want to study ozone so you want uv to get absorbed enough so that you can measure that absorption and then study the ozone in our stratosphere clear similar with the water vapor you want to study water vapor you utilize a band which is highly uh, which highly absorbs water vapor no, sorry reverse which water vapor highly absorbs okay and then you can study water vapor concentration easily so then uh, with microwave there is a benefit that microwaves are transparent to clouds so if you have a cloudy day or a cloudy atmosphere you want to study the surface you can utilize microwave technique or microwave region of our electromagnetic spectrum and that microwave will pass through the clouds without any effect 
So though that is helpful when you're trying to study the surface features on a cloudy day. And lot of the times there are clouds. Okay, even if it's not raining, lot of the part of the world is covered with clouds all the time. Uh, so microwave is very helpful in those cases. So atmospheric windows, as I was discussing, you can see here, numbers are mentioned here, like 1 to 16. So these are like uh, different, different windows. So invisible, and then uh, in infrared, uh, here in, in uh, infrared, and then you keep going, la large infrared, far infrared, sorry, not large, far, FIR, and then you keep on going like that. So these are different windows. And gray area means absorption, so absorbed by the atmosphere. Okay? So these are like 16 channels for GOES R series. So these are series of satellites. They use these 16 channels to study the atmosphere and surface of the Earth. So 16 channels of GOES are mentioned here in this image. So the, what is remote sensing techniques? So if you broadly divide the remote sensing techniques, there are two ways of doing it. One is imaging. One is spectroscopy. So imaging, simple, we all understand, we take a picture. Like we take with our, for like a camera. Okay, you're just putting a fancy, high resolution, highly advanced camera in a satellite. So those uh, visible window we have, we can take images. So a lot of the missions for planetary uh, missions, like Mars or other planets you send, you at least put an imaging camera. You might have heard, like there is an imaging camera there. Because first we want to at least see like how a planet looks like, how a particular object looks like, right? First to understand it, you want to see it. So and also you want to see it in visible spectrum because in that you see the true colors. Otherwise, if you use infrared, ultraviolet or microwave, you only get gray images, gray scale images because they are not true colors, okay? So first you take an image, then you go for a spectroscopy. Because spectroscopy means you utilize different, different wavelengths to study the spectrum of that particular surface or atmosphere. And then you understand in more details. So that is not colored image, that you just only get graphs or some grayscale image. And then you try to identify features or something from that, all right? So there are certain of them, <coughs> as I mentioned, imaging, spectroscopy, remote sensing from ground, occultation techniques, so that limb measurements I was mentioning, and gravitational field measurements. So imaging is simple as I mentioned. You try to image the surface or the atmosphere using visible range. That is what imaging mostly is. Sometimes you go a little bit here and there, but mostly when you do it uh, in visible, that is called imaging. Okay? Sometimes imaging is also done in other wavelengths like X-ray. So here is one uh, like thing is mentioned. Lot of people using uh, these uh, telescopes. They use X-rays to image certain objects so that they can understand their atmospheres. Because atmosphere absorb these X-rays, any atmosphere, not just Earth. You have any atmosphere, they absorb X-rays or shorter wavelengths very efficiently. They get absorbed very quickly. You might be like, why? You guys don't ask questions. Whatever I say, you are like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Nobody will ask me like why. Do you know why? No, but still you won't ask. Th then how will you learn? I cannot answer everything. See, I can also forget something. Like he asked me a question, I was able to answer it. Otherwise, I might have forgotten it. And you might have learned a half uh, truth, right? Or half science. So you should ask questions. Don't just believe what I'm saying. Okay. So, okay, I'll tell you this. The thing is, these very high energetical particles or wavelength or energy which are coming, they get absorbed very quickly and then they dissociate molecules. So they, uh, they are the main reason for photochemistry to happen in the upper atmosphere. So upper atmosphere, when we learn about upper atmosphere, there is a separate lecture. Then we will see how this high energy radiation is responsible for all the photochemistry happening in the upper atmosphere of different planets. That was a long sentence. Okay. So the thing is, as soon as this high energy beam or radiation is incident on any molecule, they break apart molecule. Okay, because they are so high energetic, they get absorbed in that way. It's not that somebody is like sitting there very happily, oh come and absorb. It's not happening like that. It's just this molecule, they absorb these and the bonds are broken. 
because of this very high energy. As you get to a lower energy, they do not have enough uh, energy or quantum energy to break apart these molecules, they, they can just go through easily, relatively easily. Okay? Clear? Okay. When we will get to photochemistry, I will ask again and let us see how many of you will remember. Okay. So, again, uh, most of this is done in uh, optical, as I said. And then uh, it employs CCD direct uh, detectors. Uh, I don't know what these are, but uh, these are very popular names, CCD de uh, detectors. I'm not like a uh, instrumentation guy, so I'm not too much aware of these. But these are different detector arrays people use. Okay. So again, uh, in imaging, there is one more thing you can do. You can add a layer to it. So you can take an image in a particular wavelength, and then you can take image in the multiple wavelengths and then you combine all this image in one data set and that is known as image cube because now you have it in three dimension one image in three dimensions because you have spectral information also lot of hyper hyper spectral images are done like that and this data is stored as image cube and this is very popular uh, in some of the image uh, missions like galileo mission for uh, jupiter and then WIMS on Cassini mission for Saturn and then Marses and Vitris on board Mars Express and Venus Express respectively. So, for different missions this kind of technique was used because you can put one instrument it can measure at different wavelengths and just compress the data in one cube. So, this data is very useful. So, now coming to spectroscopy. So, spectroscopy depends on two things first the central wavelength you are trying to measure in the numerator that is there lambda naught which is the central wavelength you are trying to measure. But practically or realistically you cannot measure at one single wavelength your equipment or whatever you are using it has certain resolution. Okay. So, that width of resolution is delta lambda that is minimum resolved wavelength uh, for a particular equipment is. So, better the uh, resolution power means smaller this uh, delta lambda will be okay because this is the resolution power of that equipment. So, smaller it is better your resolution will be. So, that is why you try to get it as small as possible as close to as central wavelength you can get. So, depending on these two values your r will vary which is resolution. So, if it is around 100 that means it is a very ro low resolution equipment and if it goes to like 10 power 3 or 10 power 4 then it becomes mid or high resolution equipment. So, again depending on your application or your mission you put a certain kind of instrument there. So, the calibration of a spectrum is performed in a silver way as for imaging. So, first you uh, take uh, images uh, and then you try to calibrate it in a spectroscopy also. First you have certain ground truth measurements. Okay. So, that database high trend you remember. So, we have those spectrums. Now, you in the lab you measure using your instrument a spectrum and then you compare what you are getting. So, any instrument is not actually measuring a spectrum also it is measuring only the voltage changes because everything is electronics. So, shift in voltage. So, you try to calibrate that voltage change with the actual spectrum and see for example, if the surface temperature is let us say 300 kelvins and in your instrument is giving 2 volts change. So, you should know that okay, 2 volts means 300 kelvins. Okay. Then only you can utilize the instrument otherwise these are just numbers you are getting from a particular equipment all the numbers will be there and those numbers would not mean anything unless you know the calibration or the base value and then you can do that. Okay. So, remote sensing from ground how do you do that? Uh, again you can do them using active radar or lidar or passive just radiometer and spectrometer. So, remote sounding. Okay, so, whenever you heard this term sounding, sounding does not mean somebody is playing music okay, uh, or uh, there is no sound happening. Sounding means you are trying to get a profile of a particular variable with altitude as simple as that. Okay. So, if you want to get a pressure profile with altitude it is called sounding. So, the technique is called sounding you are trying to sound the atmosphere. So, if you are trying to let us say measure the density variation with altitude you use sounding techniques. 
so limb measurements they are known as sounding techniques because using limb measurements you can measure the variation of density pressure or temperature anything okay with the, within the atmosphere and that will provide you a good profile so this profile whenever you are getting that is your sounding techniques you can do it with either again active or passive active again you can use your own source send a radar signal or on the ground put a lidar send a light ray upwards lidar and radar don't get confused lidar is light means it uses visible light source radar uses radio light source radar radio lidar light okay so it uses visible and radio sources that is the only difference again the difference is frequency or the wavelength you are using the technique is same you are just sending the wave or the energy packets you are measuring the scattering and the reflection which comes back okay and for like measuring different things different instruments are there uh, for ozone dops and spectrometers are used so occultation as i was mentioning earlier also i think i have explained it a lot uh, so occultation techniques happens when you have like a source you can use a solar source or you can use your own source send a signal through the atmosphere measure it on a different instrument you get the occultation measurement you get to understand the atmosphere of any planet recently a venus mission uh, utilized that uh, technique okay in that mission they uh, they had a source on the uh, spacecraft itself and that source sent a light through the atmosphere of venus and that light was captured where on earth and we captured that uh, like i won't say light the electromagnetic radiation is the correct word so the radiation which was sent it went through the atmosphere of venus came to the earth and we measured it and uh, using that we were able to understand the atmosphere of venus itself so that is a very good technique used these days okay good i think yeah so gravitational field measurement is again very important uh, technique in this we are trying to measure the variation of gravitational field of a particular planet okay and gravitational field also affects the atmospheric patterns okay we will see like gravity waves and all in a uh, future lectures but the thing is this gravity has a very significant role on sustaining an atmosphere higher the gravity more atmosphere you will sustain lower the gravity less atmosphere you will sustain also the changes in gravity causes some perturbation in the atmosphere also depending on if you have a hill or a big cavity okay impact feature then the atmospheric patterns will change helles basin on mars is so big that it has its own micro atmosphere okay it is so big it's a very big basin big cavity there so it uh, it is so deep that it uh, about 8 kilometers deep so it has its own little micro atmosphere so that's how gravity or shape can affect uh, the atmosphere so that is why gravitational measurements are done again simple techniques are like you use uh, gravimeters and second technique is that you use the flight of the spacecraft so if it perturbs goes up and down you can tell how much gravity it it is affecting or how much gravity is affecting the path of the spacecraft itself and you correct your course also using thrusters or something like that because you don't want your spacecraft to get too close otherwise it will fall or if it gets too far it may go away forever so you want to control its orbit using these gravity measurements so there are multiple techniques okay so that's all before we go away i have one more final question for you uh we learned that the light scatters more when you have shorter wavelengths so that's why sky appears blue 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 cause blue lights get scattered more right and red light get scattered less so towards evening we see more red sun so the uh, now we have vi uh, like the visible is starting from violet okay violet indigo blue we big your you know that so why sky doesn't appear violet then why it appears blue no we can see violet i can show you violet here no our eyes are not more sensitive to uh, blue that is a misconception if you have that think 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 i will start asking these questions so that you guys won't sleep here
this is the color spectrum we have right so the thing is why we are getting sky blue it should scatter more in violet we know that so if it is scattering more violet then the sky is only appearing blue not violet excuse me be louder i cannot hear you you have to be louder ozone layer no nothing with all ozone only absorbs ultraviolet we cannot see that anyways you have to think like you have to combine two or three things together if you only think violet 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 you won't get the answer you are in a like a class which is slightly advanced okay so you have to think little bit not too much uh, okay so i'll give you the answer imagine the planck's radiation curve for sun it peaks at green so i'm just exaggerating it so the sun's curve look like this so it peaks around green so around green color according to color i have made the spectrum you remember the planck's law we had that curves for uh, uh, black body curves so for sun it looks like this okay so since it peaks at green so you have more intensity or radiation available at green as compared to any other color so there are two competing effects first more radiation is coming towards this green and lesser here and but this one is scattered more so because of do these two competing effects the blue is the maximum scattered okay we don't even see violet because there is not enough violet coming from the sun itself and that is the reason there is not enough violet light coming from the sun so there are two competing effects not enough light and not uh, uh, so you got the idea okay we uh, there is another class so i have to leave thank you so much